Well, hello. Um, you certainly made an entrance there. I did. It's me. <laughs> Hi. Um, good afternoon to everyone. My name is Kate Wickett and I'm the CEO of Sydney World Pride. And I'd like to thank you all for coming. It's been an incredible last few days and some incredible speakers. Um, but before we introduce this incredible panel, I'm going to hand over to Lil uh, to do the acknowledgement of country. Hi everyone, um, I'd certainly like to acknowledge country, acknowledge that we are on the lands of the Gadigal people and paying my heartfelt respect to our elders past and present um, and paying respects to all Aboriginal people present in the room. Um, what I'd like to do very quickly though is, is get you to have a think about a place that's really important to you a place that you may have been going for years. Uh, it could be the tree in your backyard. I want you to have a think about that place. Have a think about what you hear when you're there. What do you see when you're there? What can you feel on your skin? What can you smell? I hope it's good smells. What can you taste? But importantly, who do you remember? What are the memories you have when you're at that place? So when we acknowledge country, we're acknowledging the fact that we're connected to that space. So if you can imagine you go, that you've been going there for 10 years, been going there for your generations for 100 years, been going there for 200 years. Imagine being connected to that place with your ancestors for 60,000 plus years. All of our people, all of our memories, that tree, that rock, that sand, that water, it holds all of that for you. So when you're there, it's strongest for you there. Uh, and that's why we acknowledge country, and we do it a lot. Um, so I just wanted to take the time to really help people connect to that space. So when you're at that place again, have a think about that. Have a think about everything that's come before you and what that means and where you are, because it's a really incredibly special place. I know not everybody's from this country, um, but it's a beautiful country, and I love this country, and I love being First Nations. So thank you so much. Thanks for that, Lil, and perfect segue to introduce you, everyone. This is Liz Gordon, pronouns she, her. Lil Gordon, Lil. First assistant. Liz was another life. No. Yeah. <laughs> first assistant secretary and First Nations outcomes for the Department of Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development. So welcome to the panel. Thank you. Sitting next to Lil is Ryan Phillips. Ryan Phillips, uh, pronouns are he, him. And Ryan Phillips is the DEPSEC at the Victorian Department of Justice and Community Safety and is also a director, a board director for Equality Australia. So welcome, Ryan. <laughs> and next to Ryan is Michelle O'Neill, president of the Australian Council of Trade Unions. Her pronouns are she, her. Welcome. I've got some, some fans in the audience, I love it. And finally, but never last, uh, Todd Sears is the CEO of Out Leadership. Welcome, Todd. Thanks, Kate. So today's discussion is really around workplace inclusion and what that looks like in 2023 and some of the challenges that we still face and where, where we've come from. Um, I thought I'd just start the panel by giving you uh, a quick pricey of um, my experience, I, I came out in a small country town here in, Ad, in Australia called Adelaide and uh, uh, I was 16 and I've always been out in the workplace so I started as a, a lawyer um, in a firm after graduating and for me I have only ever felt homophobia once in the workplace and that's very uncommon I know for a number of people. Um, but what I've experienced in the workplace is consistent sexism and misogyny. Um, and I think we, uh, we often talk about homophobia, but I think those, uh, they're absolutely not uh, mutually exclusive to the sexism and, and, and um, misogyny that, that women feel. And certainly that's something that I've discussed with a lot of other professionals. Um, so from the ages of 20 to 30, I saw incremental change in the workplace. And then from 30 to 40, and I'm 42 on Sunday, um, closing ceremony, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> nice big party. Well planned. Yeah. yeah. Um, walk across the bridge, can't wait. Um, so, but in the last 10 years, I've seen a, a seismic and exponential change in workplace policies um, around DNI. 
Um, but we're going to unpack some of the more the detail. Um, I thought I would start by asking each of the um, panel members to give their short pricey of their particular um, area or field and where they think um, we are uh, in Australia and then Todd from an international perspective, where are we at with true workplace and inclusion and, and policies? Do you want to kick us off, Leo? Sure. It's an easy question. Uh, I, look, I think for me, in my experience, I've had 34 years in government. I uh, started when I was two. So, um, <laughs> you know, I guess for me it's hard from an intersectionality point of view, so I can't probably call out what's necessarily been homophobic, maybe what's been racism, what's been sexism. I kind of feel like sometimes it's all wrapped up in one and, and I have to sit there sometimes and think, you know, which is the bit that they didn't like the most out of me at a particular time. So I think I have seen change over time, but pockets of change. Mm. Uh, and a lot of that's depended on the leadership at the time, depending on where I've worked um, and what that's looked like. As a, in terms of me being a leader in any role, um, one of the things that's been really important for me is to call that out very, very visibly when those things happen um, and be able to follow up with people as they do. So I do think there is a change, but like I said, I think it's still in pockets um, and at times I'm not sure which thing it is that makes up the total of who I am um, as to which thing's been considered to be discriminated against. Uh, on the whole, I find that it's really important for us to keep building those relationships. That's where I've found the mm. better change or things to keep on occurring. Uh, having great leaders, there's one sitting in front here, won't mention her name too much, um, that who are visible in the space and willing to continue to be who they are uh, at any one time. So when I rock up, I rock up as the total package and uh, I'm incredibly proud of that and I think that helps others be that um, and helps others not challenge it so much for those who aren't in leadership roles. Yeah, great. I think I'll come back to leadership because it's a, a topic that I want to um, talk about in length. Um, now, Ryan, you're based in Victoria and you're a, you're a Deputy Secretary, so for those who aren't familiar with our hierarchical government system, Deputy Secretary is a very senior position within the government. So, Ryan, what, what's it looking like in Victoria? So I think uh, Victoria is a very progressive state and I think we've had a progressive government um, in place now for a considerable period of time and the effects of that are well and truly being felt in our, in our public sector workforces um, and I personally as a trans person have seen the experience that I have had in the work, workplace and the level of comfort I've had being out transform over the 15 years I've been in the BPS. So personally, um, the leadership, whether that's political, but also executive level leadership is absolutely critical to the employee experience. Um, but now as a, an executive, I run a service system with about 5,000 employees. Um, and they are employees working um, across the state uh, with men and women in custody, with men and women um, uh, in the community, some of the most vulnerable people. Um, and it's all well and good for us to have the right policies in place. And you know, that's what leadership is. We set the frame, we get the policies. And I would say um, diversity policies where I work are, are, are great, always room for improvement, but are great. Where the gap is, emerges and where the deep work is required is how do you then translate those policies on the ground? Um, in, a, in a big workforce, um, there's a culture change piece. Um, so you can't just have the policies without the strategies to work deeply with people, um, with a very diverse workforce, uh, with, with a workforce with a range of education levels. Um, you have to think in, and you have to be committed to the long-term change process in order to get the outcomes you want. Yeah, great, okay. I, again, a, a common thread already I'm hearing is around leadership and whether that's uh, from our uh, from our legislators or from our managers, um, something I'll come back to as I said. Michelle, what's your uh, experience in the union movement? Thanks, Kate, and I just want to acknowledge the Gadigal people as well and pay my respects to elders past and present, always was and always will be, and the Australian Union Movement's really proud to be part of supporting the Yes campaign um, this year. And our movement's got a really long and proud history of fighting for rights for LGBTIQA plus workers, and there's many stories to tell, but I just want to touch on the fact that uh, on Saturday night at Mardi Gras, we had proud of place on the back of our float, um, Jeremy Fisher. And 50 years ago this year, 
Jeremy um, was a student, a gay activist, a student at Macquarie Uni, and he got evicted from his college because of his activism and because of his sexuality. And it was the construction union at the time, the BLF, um, that put what we think is the very first industrial action in support of um, queer rights when they went on strike to get Jeremy reinstated back into that college, um, what became to be known as the pink bands. And of course, um, many of, of unionists were involved in, in the very first Mardi Gras. But really, what, what matters for us as unionists is that you know, rainbows are great, but we fight for rights. And the history, the, the history of union activism is one which is, you've got to make the structural change because it's not just about attitudes and culture. It's about what power you have in a workplace. And for workers, and particularly for people who are working class people, it is about how do you get systemic rights so that it's not a matter of just being recognised or included, but that you um, have some power. And the way we think power comes about is by joining together with others, which is at our core as unionists. That's, that's what we're about. And so it is, I think, going, from going forward and looking forward, it's about what do we do now and what we've done really recently to make sure that we make changes in things like enterprise agreements, minimum rights and conditions that recognise people's uh, rights in terms of their gender identity, being able to um, have their relationships recognised, their sexuality recognised, not be discriminated against because, of course, you're more likely to face violence at work, harassment at work, discrimination at work, but also you're more likely to be in lower paid and more insecure work if you're a queer worker. I mean, that's the reality. Um, and so our story is one of saying we have examples of unions all over the country winning changes in agreements and in law. We won just in December. Um, new rights in our workplace work laws in the Fair Work Act for intersex workers and against discrimination on the basis of your gender that used to just be in the Sex Discrimination Act, but now we've lifted up and won into our Fair Work Act. So I'm just going to end by saying this, Kay. Um, uh, I remember as a, a unionist, we, ha we stand for election for leadership, right? Democratic processes. And one of the first election campaigns I stood for to lead my union, um, there's a history of things called shit sheets, um, when people don't want you to get elected. And I remember the shock when I saw the one that was using my sexuality as the argument as to why I shouldn't lead working people for a better life. And that was a long time ago, but it still hurts to this day that that somehow was the argument that we as um, you know, leaders of our movement, back to your leadership question, somehow you know, our sexuality, how we identify um, is the basis of people not thinking that we are as good or as have rights. So we fight every day against that. Yeah, great, thank you. I think that's a, a kind of perfect segue he hearing from two people in the government and then a union. And Todd, you are based in America typically when you're not travelling. Um, Some days. That's where my dog is. Yeah. <laughs> and you have, uh, well, you're a, covering in, you're, you're a recovering stockbroker. Recovering banker, I'd like to yes. say, yes. Um, so for those who don't know, um, Todd, do you want to just quickly have a, a, a short... Uh, talk about what it is you do um, and what your corporate lens is because you do deal with um, the higher end of, of business in terms of corporate. So sure. what are the corporates doing to include and be more representative and protective of our community? Before I do that, can we all thank Kate for the amazing job she has done on this entire conference? <laughs> I'm still standing. I don't, I don't know how you do it. I've got to go to the women's party tonight. <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, well, thank you. And I really appreciate being included in this conference. It's been truly amazing. I think this is my 21st event in the last nine days, including out leadership events and World Pride. So 
Um, we had 45 CEOs last night at the Park Hyatt to talk about LGBT rights, which is the first time that's ever happened in history, I think. So it's been a pretty full on yeah. time. Um, so by virtue of background, if I haven't met you, I'm Todd Sears. I, um, I self-describe as a recovering banker. I started in Wall Street in the late 90s um, in investment banking. And I had a very similar experience to what it sounds like you had. I had a homophobic boss for my first job. And I left that company and I went to a smaller investment bank and I was super out in my interview and they were like, dude, it's fine, calm down. Um, <laughs> but what it allowed me to do was connect my orientation and my identity to business. And I was able to win business for that company. And I switched sides of the world in 2001 and I went to Merrill Lynch. And in 2001, not a single Wall Street firm in the world had ever spoken to the LGBT community. In the United States, there were over 1,049 rights at a federal level the gay and lesbian couples did not receive because marriage equality wasn't even on the horizon. 90% of those financial, were financial. And I thought, well, couldn't we as a financial services institution help the community? And so I partnered with Lambda Legal and I did domestic partner planning seminars all over the country. Um, and over the first five years at Merrill, I brought in almost $2 billion of LGBT assets to Merrill Lynch. But I tracked it as a business, and I said to Merrill from the very beginning, I can't do this if you don't support the community. We have to have inclusive policies. We have to support gay organizations. And in 91 years, Merrill had never sponsored a gay organization. Five years in, they were spending almost $4 million in our community to support our rights because I proved it was a business. So I ultimately had a couple other jobs, and I was laid off in 2010. And I thought, well, where, when was it the happiest? When, it was when I was getting an Irish Catholic, old school American company like Merrill Lynch to support gay rights because I proved it was a business. And in 2010, companies were still not speaking about our rights and our community in the business framework. And so I took my severance check from Credit Suisse and I started a thing I called Out on the Street originally. And the idea was to get Wall Street, financial services, CEOs, and businesses, Davos, World Economic Forum, that kind of idea, to come together to talk about business, talent, equality, but in that order. I wanted them to understand that our rights are core to their business. It's not just a nice thing to do, not a warm fuzzy, but it's core to how they operate. And I got the then CEO of Deutsche Bank at the time, Seth Waugh, to host my first summit. And I had Bank of America, Barclays, Citi, Deutsche, Goldman Sachs, and Morgan Stanley. And we were 200% oversubscribed for the first summit. And it was business leaders, bankers. It was not HR diversity leaders who, of course, get it. But if you can get business leaders to get it, they have power. Economic power, just like you were saying with the unions, right? That collective opportunity. That's exactly my idea. So I expanded in Europe 11 years ago. We partnered with Stonewall. We have 86 nonprofit partners globally. Out Leadership, the organization that now stands, is a B Corp. If you don't know B Corps, it's a social enterprise. We reinvest our profits in our mission. We were the first gay B Corp in history. Launched in Europe, launched in Hong Kong 10 years ago. Our summit in Hong Kong was the first gay summit ever in Asia. And we launched here in Sydney eight years ago. Pride and Diversity has been a tremendous partner of ours, as has Equality Australia, K8 all of these amazing leaders in these organizations. We now have 98 companies around the world that are members of OutLeadership. Our summits are in New York, London, Hong Kong, Paris, and Sydney each year. We built talent initiatives as well for young LGBTQ leaders because I thought, all right, we've got CEOs and business leaders. What is there for the next generation of talent? So my Out Next program has 10,000 young leaders globally. We have an Out Women program, which Kate's been a part of and a lot of other folks. I, they kindly call me their lesbro, which I appreciate. <laughs> and then a board program because LGBTQ people are still not represented at the corporate board level. So I started Quorum eight years ago to change board policies. We were able to get the NASDAQ in the United States to amend their board diversity guidelines. We helped them with their SEC filing. So all 5,600 companies on the NASDAQ actually have a board diversity requirement that is now LGBTQ inclusive because of OutLeadership's data. We're doing the same thing in London with the London Stock Exchange. And by the way, their CEO, Julia Hoggett, is a gay woman. Pretty cool. First woman in 330 years London Stock Exchange, and she's gay. And we're trying to do the same thing here. The ASX, only seven companies out of the ASX 200 have inclusive board diversity policies that include LGBT people. So that's my framework, the idea that business can drive change around the world. We've gotten so many leaders and companies to help with marriage equality here in Australia, in Ireland, Hong Kong, same-sex uh, same um, spousal benefits. But we are still illegal in 67 countries around the world. 67. Singapore just decriminalized in August, which is amazing. And I think that's because of the business community. 19% of Singapore's GDP is financial services. So if 19% of your GDP says that gay people shouldn't be illegal, shouldn't you listen? So that's our framework, and my goal is that all 67 of those countries, my companies understand how they can affect that change. We've built tools and research and data and all that kind of good stuff. But that's the idea, is mobilizing as a corporate community globally to make sure that we're free and equal and then understood.
Yeah, thank you, Todd. You raise an um, interesting point around the business case for change. And I recall going to a Goldman Sachs function actually about 15 years ago where the very straight managing director stood up and said, we are going to have this policy because um, we want the best and brightest talent. And I think there's always two, two sides of looking at the, the same result, right? Um, lots of corporates will say we want the business case for changes, a happier, healthier uh, workforce is a more productive workforce and it hits the bottom line. But what if, and this is a question for you, Ryan, um, what happens when the, the corollary to that is, well, actually, you're an, you're a, you're a com, you're an, your organisation is a government. Mm. You don't make profit. Mm. What's the impetus to change if it's not the bottom line and, in, in, and necessarily improving productivity, which it may do? Mm. Some people say you should do it because it's the right thing to do. Mm. So what, what's your perspective of that as a, you know, particularly as a, a trans yeah. man? I'd say it's a values proposition for, you know, the values are at the heart of the public service. You know, we're there to serve, you know, the people of, of the nation, of the state. Um, but the, we, and we must reflect the people that we serve. So if we don't, if we can't understand our client base, um, we're not going to get the right outcomes for the community. Um, I know, you know, my patch, um, you know, as I said before, some of the most vulnerable people, we know um, LGBTI people are at, you know, high risk of social exclusion may end up in the criminal justice system, may, may not. But that certainly the, the risk, if, if I can't provide inclusive services to the people they serve, that affects us all. Um, so there is a strong business case, I think, um, both from a uh, LGBTI diverse workforce, but then having the policies and systems in place for our clients as well. So there's two parts uh, from a government perspective, I think. Yeah. And Lil, um, you're in the government as well. You spoke earlier about and touching back on leadership, um, and you've pointed out Kate Foy in the front row there. Um, what do you consider, and, and for you, what is good leadership, and how, how, is, how are your leaders um, ensuring that despite the fact that you've got policies in place, and let's face it, if your company doesn't have a policy, and my personal view is if your organisation doesn't have inclusive policies, or procedures, which are, in my view, pretty base. What organisation are you working for? Uh, I mean, that, that's, you know, that, where we were talking about those policies 10 years ago. Now that most organisations do have policies, uh, how do you see your leaders implementing or living the values that they espouse? Yeah, look, I mean, I think on the whole, I see it uh, on a, in a positive realm a lot. Uh, more recently than anything. I mean, uh, my current secretary, Jim Betts, is, um, uh, he's amazing in terms of how he just, he lives and breathes his, the values every day. Um, so he will challenge wherever something's not, not right. Uh, he will openly talk um, about policies that we have or inclusion in general. And I think when we talk workplace inclusion, it's really understanding what that is. I think we can say it. You know, and we can say we've got a policy and we've got all these things, but what truly does it actually mean? Uh, and so leaders who can articulate that well uh, is really a key to that and what that means for their particular organisation or their department. So, you know, I often challenge the concept of workplace inclusion. It's, um, if I think of it as a dance floor, because, you know, it is Mardi Gras, um, you know, it's, yes, you can be invited there, but the music that's playing still isn't the music that you dance to. Um, and so when does everyone else get to dance to your tune as well? Mm -hmm. So it's about people who can be able to sit with people who understand the other music that needs to be played uh, and be willing to play it um, and have everyone else come along. And I think um, there are a number of leaders that I've had certainly that do that. And, uh, and like I said, for me, it's important as all of those things um, and being a, an out and proud lesbian, uh, out and proud wearing the dreadlocks and turning up as I am, um, that our people recognise that you are, you're a willingness to do that too and you do cop stuff uh, as a result, but you're still going to show up. And one of the things for me that was one of the, the turning points for me or 
one of those really special moments when I was um, finishing up at the head of Aboriginal Affairs, um, a, a staff member who I hadn't met yet, COVID because of, stood up and said, you know, I came here because Lil was the leader because she was willing, she's out there, she's being who she is, she's openly gay, um, she, you know, her leadership is really important and I came here because I knew that I was going to be safe and I could be myself and I think that's the part that's incredibly important uh, in terms of being in leadership roles. You are modelling all of those behaviours but it's important for our communities. I mean, having a job in, a pub in public service, um, you know, you're on a good wicket and it's ex economic prosperity. It's what you're doing that brings that for your family and for your community as well. So it's not just about being inclusive in the public service. It's all of those things that come with that job as well as the values of serving our people. Yeah, great. Um, it sounds really it's a, about tone from the top, right? Absolutely. And, and the leaders set the tone um, and it's, it has to be more than rhetoric. And celebrated, you know. I think it's not just about a policy. It's really celebrating. Mm. Look at the look at who we have as the people who are part of our department. Uh, it brings us every facet of community, which is going to make us be able to do our job better, surely. Yeah, sure. Um, I just want to remind those um, in the audience that you can also submit questions. <laughs> so um, I'm sure you're very familiar with Slido. Uh, please feel free to send your questions in. Should you have any for our esteemed panellists. Um, I'd like to go back to you, Michelle, and ask, you know, you, you've you got kind of a, a view of a lot of union activity and, and you deal with and understand many, many different experiences within the, within the union movement as they relate to workplace practices. Um, what do you think some of the leadership qualities that you've seen have worked well, um, but also those who haven't which haven't worked well for, for really uh, encouraging and um, bringing through diversity. Thanks, Kate. Um, I suppose the first thing I'd say is that leadership's important, but it's not enough. Um, so I love seeing diverse leaders and, you know, it, it gives you a boost and it's powerful and, it, and you know, it, it, it does bring about change. But if all you do is change the people at the top, and who they are and how um, diverse they are, then you're not really driving the change that goes all the way through to every worker and every person in an organisation. So I think representation and organising matter more than leadership. Um, and so um, if you think, and what I mean by that is that, um, just li listening to you, Todd, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fascinating story, but. For me, if the, if the argument is, is solely a business case, what if you make more money discriminating? You know, what if being anti-trans is going to make you a lot of money? Um, it can't just be um, that the profit motive or the business case is the argument for change because it doesn't always lead you to the right place. That's true. Um, so the way to bring about fundamental change is to make sure you connect people and you bring about um, a groundswell of change in terms of people's opinions and those opinions lead to change in procedures, policies, rights, laws because you need more than goodwill. You need something to rely on when things go wrong, when it gets tough. You need to be able to call it out and know that if you're a casual and insecure worker, if you call out that you're being discriminated against because you're queer, um, they don't have to say I'm sacking you for that right now. And we've got more and more workers in this country in insecure jobs. You're just gone. You just don't get the next shift or the next roster. Nobody ever says that's why. Um, so unless we do something about changing um, the, the way we create jobs, what are the opportunities that people genuinely have to have secure, good quality jobs where they're fully recognised for what they do um, and who they are? Mm -hmm. And equality is so critical to that. Okay. And that's got to be at every single level, Kate. Mm. Um, and so good leadership is recognising you being there is not enough. Good leadership is making sure that you're not threatened by workers getting together and saying, this is the change that will really make a difference in our organisation, whether it's a business or a government department or a union. No, and it's threatening sometimes. You know, I'm a leader. Sometimes people call you out and you go, shit. You know, like, it's hard. It's a lot harder to actually 
be open to what are the fundamental changes rather than just telling the story of how inclusive we are. I agree. Yeah, Can great I... answer. And I, I... Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's exactly the, the point I was trying to make around the business case for change. It's, it's, the corollary obviously is, well, shouldn't we be doing that because it's the right thing to do, mm -hmm. not necessarily to increase productivity. Mm. Um, but of course, diversity in of itself increases uh, the richness and diversity of thought. And I think a lot of the time we talk about diversity in, in respect of whether it be um, race or gender or sexuality, but we often forget about uh, you know, cognitive diversity. Uh, and I think that's something that um, I've always thought about when, when working in different places. Um, now, going back to you, Todd, um, uh, what you obviously deal with a lot of um, the higher end corporates. What what would you say to you know the smaller SMEs and the smaller kind of mums and dads and folks kind of smaller businesses because mm -hmm. um, you typically deal with the higher end. Yep. Actually, I want to pick up on what we were just talking about if that's okay, and I'll yeah, of weave course. that in. And there are a couple of questions here I think I can tie into. So when I started my business model 20 years ago, that was the only thing people would listen to. Right, from our rights perspective, it was the bottom line opportunity. That world has changed dramatically, so I completely agree with you. It's not just about profit motive. But I actually think that in the future, so ESG strategies, most companies now have an ESG strategy, environmental, social, and governance. And that's what I've been focusing on. That's part of our new 10-year ambition. We're trying to embed LGBT equality into ESG strategies because it's how companies have to do business. So the profit motive is everything, so it's talent, it's uh, employees being able to mobilize and to unionize and to be able to have fair, safe wages, all of those pieces are what leaders expect of companies, right? If you think of Gen Z, they literally want to know what a company does for their environment and their social responsibility before they join a company. That's the profit motive, it's the talent. These companies will not be able to attract the next generation of talent, especially our community, if they're not doing the right things in these models. So I completely agree with you 100%, but when I started, they wouldn't listen to anything except for profit. Now that, that whole model has shifted because of so much work that so many people have done. So it, it, is, it is all intrinsic, and I think for small companies or big companies or any company, if you have two employees or 300,000 employees, you have to be sustainable. You have to treat your employees fairly, and that's not, by the way, I think I'd love to see us get away from even the diversity and inclusion terms. It's just humanity, right? We love to put people in boxes and LGBTQIA+, we make it hard for people sometimes. Our allies don't, they can't keep up with all of our acronyms and, and then they are afraid to say the wrong thing and then they don't say anything, which is the absolute wrong thing. And the opportunity for us to think about even intersectionality, right? You, you mentioned, Lil, how you bring all the different pieces of you, but you're just Lil, right? right? And that you show up in different spaces. And if I'm just Lil. <laughs> You're the, you said you were the total, the total package. The total package. Right? I totally agree. I stand corrected. The total package. But I think that's how companies have to think about it, right? Because we've we focused on a lot of the policies, and policy does not equal culture. People don't leave a company because of the policy. They leave a company because of a homophobic manager. Right? And that's the framework that we've got to shift to. Yeah, okay, I think that really opens it. I want to, uh, this is a question for each of you, but I think that's a, a really good segue into understanding what do you think some of the threats are to workplace inclusion? Um, if it's not a homophobic person, what, are they internal threats? Are they external threats? W what's your view? Well, I'll start with you, Lil. Look, I think the concept of unconscious bias is still there. Um, and people will have that until they're able to have some, probably those deeper conversations with people. So one of the things that I find is trying to create space within an organisation for people to, to actually connect with each other and know each other on a different level uh, and be able to think about their own unconscious bias in that. You know, why, you know, why do I look at someone like that or why does that frighten me so much if um, you know, someone's from our community? What, what is it that really... Uh, means that they can have those conversations, start to think about why why I behave that way mm. uh, is one part of it. But I, look, I truly believe too, the other part is that you, you have to call it out. 
it has to be visible uh, and we have to know that people are going to be safe and people need to know they're going to be safe because something's going to be challenged if it's not if it's not meeting the needs of the people of the, the, the organisation that they work in. You've got to be able to be safe in that. Yeah, great. Thank you. Brian? Yeah, I'll probably take my answer in a bit of a different direction, probably. I think the biggest threat is about the broad kind of macro conditions when we're talking about what's happening around the world. Um, coming out of, out of a pandemic and the impact on people's economic status around the world. You know, I've got the threats facing us by, with climate change. The, the, the wide scale disruption um, and the impact of that on the most vulnerable in the community has a direct impact on LGBTI inclusion. The reason for that, I mean, if it's not, if it's not doesn't speak for itself, um, we know that many people in our community, whether it's in Australia, but particularly overseas, are already you know, marginalised, disenfranchised, economically vulnerable. When these big shocks happen, um, we're the first to be affected. Um, it also creates uh, a very fertile environment for the rise um, of fringe groups, such as the right movement, which we see um, happening um, overseas, but also in Australia. I mean, I see it in my work um, with communications from the far right about treatment of trans people um, in my service system. Um, it is real, it's happening in Australia. And I think they are products of kind of broader, uh, broader economic and social conditions. So unless we're addressing the macro factors, we will continue to see um, it, you know, at, at inclusion threatened at a local level. Great. Michelle, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree with what Ryan was just saying. Um, we've got rising inequality here in Australia and, and in the world, um, dramatically rising inequality. And so if it's the case that fewer and fewer, fewer people have access to real economic power and that the gulf between those at the top and those at the bottom is growing, then that's a very real threat. Um, and if people don't have... Um, power in terms of their own capacity to be treated with respect and dignity and earn enough to feed yourself and your family and know that you're going to get that shift the next week or the next month, um, then, then that's a threat in terms of inclusion because um, and recognition because the more fearful people get as well, as well as they're losing rights, they, people also become narrower. If you're scared, you get narrower. Your capacity to be open and think about what sort of needs to change reduces because you're dealing with the reality of, of hard, you know, we've got this massive cost of living increase in this country um, and around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, at the moment, there's a fight going on at the International Labour Organization so that's the, you know, the global body that's governments, unions and employers about sets, setting rights for workers in the world, a fight because some countries, your point, some countries are arguing that we've got to take out of the work program of that body any work that it should be doing in terms of discrimination against LGBTQIQA plus people, saying no. No work should happen on this. We won't support the international labour body winning rights for workers. I mean, mm. that's an extraordinary threat. And you think of the, you know, the, the um, discussion around trans and gender diverse rights and how divisive that, that is. For no um, reason. All, all of this <laughs> so is a real threat. And, and your point about you know, economic power is so critical. And if, you, if we actually fight for a more equal world, um, you cannot disconnect people's need for dignity and rights in terms of good, fair pay and conditions and a secure job, and then the right to not be discriminated against, to have health and safety that means that, you know, you, you have an obligation as an employer to prevent mm -hmm. harassment and violence, not just have a complaints policy. You know, to have, to, to have those changes happening means you've got to create a different economic system that people have more security, more connection with each other, more capacity to have those rights enshrined not just a nice idea on a policy, but enshrined so when things go wrong, you get to use them and you get to stick together with others to make that real change happen. So I, I think we shouldn't underestimate um, how we've won so much, but we sh should not underestimate how quickly it can disappear if we're not vigilant and if we don't invest and 
commit to connecting people, acting collectively and organising against those threats. And, and so that's a really great point, Michelle, and thank you because, Todd, I've heard you speak previously about, you know, our, the biggest um, enemy to kind of, to what you're saying, embedding those values um, and enshrining them not just in policy but enshrining them in culture of organisations. Todd, I've heard you speak uh, previously about um, complacency being the biggest enemy. Mm. Um, and I'd add to that probably acquiescence as well. Um, based on what Michelle has said about that kind of cultural shift of not just um, changing laws, but then also challenging the status quo mm -hmm. to ensure that we don't become complacent or acquiescent to, uh, to the status quo. What, what, what are your views? First of all, I feel like we should have another hour because there's so much to discuss here. Um, I, I completely agree. I think for Australia, for example, when marriage equality happened, a lot of people thought, oh, great, the, the gays are done. Good for you. Tick the box, right? <laughs> and we're not. Uh, same thing in the United States. Um, I'm a big fan of data and telling stories. And those are the two things I try to do without leadership. So in the United States, for example, which if we had another two hours, I could tell you about all the bananas things that are happening, like Arkansas passing an anti-drag bill, an anti-trans bill and Tennessee passing an anti-drag bill and we're going to have out leadership is actually launching the first leadership a trans leadership summit in May as part of our US summit we're going to have trans leaders from across all 98 of our companies coming together I'm going to invite the drag community the trans community and all of those leaders to really see what we can do from a legislative perspective and with all of our companies so it's there, there's a, a lot going on that we still need to do from a data perspective I launched a climate index in the United States five years ago and this is just one example to your question Kate so I rank all 50 US states on 20 publicly identifiable data points. HIV is still criminalized in 31 states in the United States. Conversion therapy is still legal in 36 of those states. Most Americans don't know that. We also rank them on what their governor says, what their state senate says, all of those sort of pieces, and I give them a number and a score, and I tie it to economic outcomes. So I know that 26% of gay people have left anti-gay, and I'm using gay instead of the entire acronym, so forgive me. 26% of our community have left anti-gay states in the last two years. That's literally an economic outcome. So Florida wants to pass the don't say gay bill. Okay, well discriminate against us and you lose our talent, but not just us, our families, our friends, companies. We've gotten companies not to expand into anti-gay states. When HB2 was passed in North Carolina, we got $50 billion of assets that were invested in North Carolina to sign a statement saying that that anti-trans bill created risk in the marketplace and decreased the return on their investment in the state. PayPal canceled an expansion. Deutsche Bank canceled an expansion. Three months later, the governor worked to repeal the law. Economic outcomes. There are economic consequences to discrimination, in my opinion. Mm. Our community is still massively, massively discriminated against, not just in the United States, around the world, and we are economically challenged. 40% of homeless youth in the United States identify as LGBTQ. The trans community in the United States is the, has the highest incidence of poverty across not just our community, but in the United States. So you're exactly right. All of these things are interconnected, and my framework is letting people know what that is. So if we can actually make it public and objective and have data and then have conversations and stories, that's the second point. We have to keep telling our stories. I know it's kind of mm. annoying to have to keep telling your coming out story all the time, right? But that's how people learn. That's how you change hearts and minds, if you put a face to it. People didn't understand trans people 20 years ago, and now people have gender non-conforming kids, and it's blown their minds, and that's how people change, right? I think that's a really good point around storytelling, and we are about to get completely wrapped up. <laughs> so I want to just ask um, the, bo uh, the board, the panel, <laughs> the panel. The board? Oh. oh, God. You don't need I've more been, people, I've Kate. Come on. I've been board meetings recently. <laughs> always a little, uh, anyway, I won't go there. Um, uh, You're almost there, Kate. You're almost there. You're almost there. Uh, <coughs> I'd like to ask the panel, if you can, in 30 seconds, let the audience know what you think the one biggest, most impactful thing that you, we, as a community and as employees, can do to make it a better workplace for all. Ooh. Oh, you're looking at me. <laughs> Go down um, the line. Oh, look, I'll be honest, I think it's, it's keep showing up. I know it's hard, um, and it's hard, I think, every day. 
Uh, and I think, I think, you know, just from my perspective, intersectionality and certainly what we're doing this year in Australia as far as a referendum mm. um, will make it a, a tough year in many ways for our First Nations, which I want to recognise. And uh, great to hear about, um, you know, supporting the Yes movement. Just disclaimer that, you know, these are the views of my, my own personal views, not the views of my department <laughs> um, you know, in that. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, I think it, it, right. if, you, if you can keep turning up uh, and being beside people, it's, it's one of the biggest things that you can keep on doing and uh, having those conversations uh, alongside people, uh, particularly where you can just see the vulnerability and the pain and all of those things is being beside people is incredibly important. Great. Thanks, Lil. 30 seconds, Ryan. Sure. I would say uh, in conversations, uh, in meetings, um, it's creating space for voices that aren't otherwise heard. Um, so being conscious who's in the room, um, why, you know, they may not have spoken, they may not want to speak, but actively working to create space for different perspectives, different voices. Um, that's what being an ally um, is, I think, is how I'd see being an ally. So we should all be working to do that, regardless of our own um, you know, intersectional status. Right. Thank you, Ryan. Michelle? Join your union. Um, <laughs> um, equality, equality is and always will be union business at our core. Right, right on brand. Thank you, Michelle. Well done. Todd, 30 seconds. I know it's hard. Oh, my gosh. I, I still don't give anything. I love it. In that same vein, change the policies. If you work for a company, ask them if LGBTQ people are included at the board level. Very simply. We actually publish all the data. You can look it up on our website. We're included in all these other levels. There are so many structures around the world that have to change. Sodomy laws have to change. Board policies have to change. We still have so much work to do to change the structures of the world and the world beating business to include us. And so that would be my ask. Mm, great. Thank you. Um, I think a lot of food for thought. Um, uh, in Australia, we have a very uh, kind of rich discussion around workplace inclusion. We obviously have Pride and Diversity, and then they have their Pride and Practice conference every year. Um, I'm quite uh, interested to see um, the discussion going from how far, you, how far are you on your journey of getting policies in place to, to what you said, Michelle, about how do we embed and enshrine um, and change cultural norms within... Uh, organisations as opposed to just policies. So policies set the framework, but people um, use the framework. So um, anyway, that was a wonderful uh, insight from you all. Thank you so much. But before I close and wrap up, I just wanted to remind everyone that this afternoon there is going to be an incredibly special presentation on the main, on the main plenary. Um, our First Nations... Uh, team will be handing over a message stick to Washington DC who is the next host of World Pride um, and it is a very uh, profound and poignant moment so please I encourage you all before you go off to ultraviolet um, <laughs> um, I'll see you there uh, before you go off to ultraviolet or any other uh, party or event or even you just pass out in your bed, you're so tired. Um, please make sure you stick around for that because it's going to be a, a beautiful ceremony. It won't go for too long, but it's very important um, from our First Nations team. So thank you all and thank you, panellists. Thank, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Great job. Nice job.